All right, welcome back, everyone. Uh, we're going to continue where we left off. Uh, so one of the things that we mentioned in our final, in our last video, was the different regions of the large intestine. Uh, one of the things I really wanted to make sure we're clear with is that the large intestine does not mean colon. Uh, those are two distinct things, but the colon is part of the large intestine. It, again, it's it's totally a terminology distinction, but we really want to make sure you're good with that so you don't make that mistake. Um, but this is a great picture here. As we mentioned, it just shows us the different regions of the large intestine. I would be comfortable with that, just like I would be comfortable with the different regions of the small intestine, as we discussed. All right. Uh, final thing on the large intestine. So we mentioned how we have the sigmoid colon. I'm just going to scroll back up to see where it was. It's this little S-shaped, as I think of it, like a sideways S structure. It is a location where fecal matter is stored until the body sends the proper signals to remove it from the body. So... Again, the eating and digesting and absorbing and even defecation process takes hours to complete, um, assuming everything's working fine, right? Sometimes it can be much slower than it should be. Sometimes it can be much faster in extreme situations. Uh, but in a normal situation, what we should observe is the, uh, the digestive process occurring, eventually breaking everything down, eventually absorbing as much as you can until inevitably you have the waste product. You have stuff that you can't really use. So what we're seeing here is that you're going to move as much of that fecal matter into that part of the colon, as we showed here, right, right above the rectum. When that part of the colon starts to fill too much, you're gonna get signals via the nervous system to the brain indicating to you, I gotta go to the bathroom, I gotta find a restroom. And that's kind of the idea that your body does a good job of letting you know it's time to release the products that you have. Um, this is a great video. I would highly suggest we pull up. I actually referenced this video at the beginning of our unit. We were mentioning how um, the body does a great job of breaking things down that you can't. So you struggle to break down certain products, especially certain plant-based products. So for instance, Brussels sprouts, a lot of different legumes and beans, corn. These are things that literally your body just can't do much to work with. But we obviously still eat them and we still gain nutrition from them. So how do we get that nutrition? Well, we use our bacteria. We use our natural biome as we called it in our last video. Uh, so this is a great video also talking about how flatulence is made. The long story short, in case you don't get a chance to watch the video, is that flatulence is something created as a byproduct of your bacteria breaking food down for you. So when you eat something that is high in fiber, for instance, or in other products that your body can't really process that well, but it feeds the bacteria really well, there's a good chance you're going to have a higher uh, release of flatulence. Uh, it's an interesting video. It kind of gives us a little bit more scientific background on that. And lastly, this is what I've been referencing a couple times, so just be clear with this. The term colon is also known as the large intestine, but the large intestine is not synonymous with colon. Uh, reason for this is the large intestine also has the rectum and anus and the cecum and the appendix and all this other stuff. All right, let's continue forward. Uh, as far as the digestive system is concerned, it is regulated by hormonal and neural reflexes. This is one of our last goals for the unit. So this is one of the things that we started off the unit discussing. So let's talk about the hormonal purposes. Like what hormones help to regulate uh, the digestive system? So these are four that I need us to know, especially just for these last two, just pay attention to the uh, prefix. You don't have to worry about uh, the whole name. Gastrin. Gastrin is a hormone that is going to help stimulate the production of hydrochloric acid or HCL, and it stimulates contractions of the stomach. Remember how we mentioned the stomach is a bit mechanical? It's like a washing machine on a low cycle, so it's kind of shaking things up a little bit. Gastrin helps with that. Secretin. Secretin helps the production of bicarbonate, which we mentioned is secreted by the pancreas. Bicarbonate, we said, is going to be a great neutralizer for the acid. So that's very important. And it helps to stimulate bile production. Remember, the liver makes bile, the gallbladder stores the bile. So be aware of those two things. These are the ones that kind of sound a little weird. Cholecystokinin and glucose insulinotropic hormone. I'm perfectly fine with just saying CCK and GIP. CCK helps to stimulate bile release and the release of pancreatic juices. So these are two very distinct hormones that sound 
not really sound similar, but their definitions are pretty similar. Secretin, as I mentioned, helps to make the bile. So let's go ahead and just underline a little bit of that for us. All right, so again, secretin is necessary for more of the stimulating bile production, whereas CCK is going to be more relating to bile release. So really, really make sure we're good with the differences between those two because they're kind of related to each other as far as they're both associated with bile. Finally, GIP, glucose insulinotropic hormone, this stimulates the release of insulin if sugar is found in the small intestine. So this plays a big responsibility in that negative feedback stuff we were talking about, especially with the short essay that was due back in the endocrine system. So glucose insulinotropic hormone lets the body know, hey, there's still sugars left over in the small intestine. We need to regulate because we're about to absorb said sugars and our blood sugar is about to go up. And if you remember, the entire purpose of insulin is to lower blood sugar. So these are a couple different hormones that we should be aware of. It would be a good idea uh, to be knowledgeable of them as far as just basic vocabulary. Now on a neural level, so remember neural is going to be more indicating the nervous system. On a neural level, there are three stages or phases that are involved with how your body controls everything. We have cephalic, gastric, and intestinal. Cephalic phase is going to include the stimulus that prepares your body for food. This can be a lot. <laughs> so for instance, the, some of this is more self-explanatory, right? If you smell food, you're going to want food, right? And by the way, when we say prepare your body for food, that can be a pretty intricate thing. But honestly, the preparation of your body for food can just be as simple as salivating. Obviously... If it's more of an extreme, you'll hear your stomach grumbling because you've been making a lot of stomach acid and all this type of stuff. But on the most basic sense, salivating, creating saliva is preparing your body for food. So again, as we were mentioning, smell, right? So you smell food in the area or a plate of food in front of you. Uh, remember, when we did senses, your sense of smell gives you incredible uh, memory information and is very vivid sight, seeing food. So this is obviously like, okay, well, you see a plate of food in front of you, but it's not only just that. You could literally see food that's not physically present. You could see food that's on a Instagram ad, for instance, and you're going to uh, start to salivate. It's, it's how these marketing stuff works so well. Taste. That's obvious, right? If you're already eating something, your body knows like, okay, we're moving through this. Sound is an interesting one. You don't have to even be looking at food or smelling food or anything like that, if you just hear someone eating, as disgusting as that may sound to some people, um, that helps your body prepare for like, okay, I guess we should get food soon. And then finally, thoughts and emotions. You can just think about food. You don't have to have any sort of stimulus in front of you that food is present or physical, but just closing your eyes and thinking about your favorite dish will cause you to salivate. Food has a lot of control, obviously, over how our body uh, functions. And last but not least, we are all very aware of this, emotions. Um, there's a reason why comfort food exists. You know, there, there's a number of different foods that we eat that just frankly make us feel better and raise our emotions. There's nothing instinctively wrong about that, but the obvious thing to state is in a situation where you are reliant on food in order to improve your emotions, that is a bit of a troubling uh, behavior. That can be uh, pretty uh, lead to a very addictive lifestyle as far as an unhealthy relationship with food. Again, am I saying when you're down, it's not, you know, don't have your ice cream, don't have your cake, don't have your mac and cheese, your mashed potatoes, whatever your comfort food is? No, that, that, they, those foods, literally secrete those dopamine things and, and neurotransmitters we were learning in the previous chapters. But just be careful. You know, it's all about balance is the whole idea. So if that's the cephalic phase, we then have the gastric phase. The gastric phase is going to involve the production of gastric juices and smooth muscle contraction in order to break food down. The gastric phase only begins when something has actually entered your body. 
So you've, you're swallowing food, for instance. It's traveling down the esophagus. It's already in the stomach. The gastric phase is really important for the stomach because those gastric juices, as we mentioned, is you're going to be your, like your hydrochloric acid, things like your pepsin. Um, and it's also going to help move the muscles to create that washing machine uh, thought process that we were talking about. Finally, last phase, as far as from the neural aspect, we have intestinal. The intestinal phase is going to involve the intestinal secretions and smooth muscle contractions moving chyme, which remember is another name for food once it's passed through the stomach. We had a Bellwork question talking about that. Um, moving chyme further along the intestines until only waste product remains. So that's pretty straightforward. Your brain sends signals to your large and small intestine, first the small, right? And basically tells it, hey, secrete what you need to secrete, break the food down any further, absorb what you need to absorb, but push this stuff along. We do not want it to be idle. Indigestion is the whole concept of that, where it can't move. And when it can't move, your body feels terrible and really starts to give you a lot of negative uh, information and how you feel. So you want to just keep it chugging, keep it moving along. And it's okay. You know, as we mentioned with the small intestine, the entire reason why it's so long is to give your body time. Food processing is not supposed to be something that you eat. And then within 10 minutes, you've got all the nourishment. <laughs> it doesn't work like that. It is a slow, methodical process, which is as a, 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 to recall some information. It's honestly a big reason why you want to try to make sure that it, when you have your dinner, you give your body reasonable time to digest. You know, as we said, and when we learned our little sleep unit stuff, um, eating at any point past 8 p.m., which I know for some of us is our only time, unfortunately, to eat. If you eat at 8 and you go to bed at 10, your body did not have enough time to digest the food and absorb the food. So thus, you're going to have to start doing that stuff while sleeping. And then, as I mentioned, that can lead to increased weight gain. So you want to be careful with that. You want to give your body time to process everything as much as possible. All right. Homeostatic imbalances of digestive system. Uh, let's just get an idea where we're at with time. Okay. So really, these last couple slides are going to be a little bit more relating to the pathophysiology, right? Some conditions that can affect the digestive system. I like to go over some conditions for every unit here and there. All right. So let's get into some stuff that I hope you're not necessarily uh, eating right now. We talked about this back in the stomach. We mentioned gastric ulcers. These ulcerations are these lesions that form. Now, ulcers are not explicit to the stomach. Ulcers can form in the esophagus. esophagus. Ulcers can form in the small or large intestine. But in this case, these are going to be more specific to the stomach because of the lining. When that uh, fundus and the grooves of the stomach starts to wear down, and especially the mucus starts to wear down, the stomach acid itself starts to eat through it. And literally, we see these regions like that, right? Um, a big thing is, or another thing that can be forming here is also what we call polyps. Polyps are, are, are excess tissue, sometimes can be cancerous. So these are things that are examined, you know, when you do a colonoscopy or, or a endoctomy. What we've observed is that there's a particular bacteria that actually eats away at the mucus. And when the mucus gets worn down enough, your stomach acid is going to naturally harm yourself. Fun fact, interesting side story to share with you guys. The scientist who discovered this bacteria was causing um, ulcers and ulcerations. There was a long standing theory that these ulcers that were forming were genetic or uh, environmental. So there was other factors. But there was a group of scientists that were thinking, wait a second, I think this might be a bacterial infection. That the bacteria is causing damage to the mucus, and in turn, your body's going to harm itself. The only way this guy could prove it, and this is honestly how a lot of science was, was done back then, was he cultured a plate of Heliobacter pylori, which is the bacteria connected to this stuff. He mixed that bacteria in a drink and drank it. Now... Normally, bacteria doesn't survive very well in the small in the in the stomach acid, but he consumed so much of it that enough was able to infect the stomach, and thus he gave himself 
lesions and ulcers. It's not like that was a death sentence. That's something that can still be worked around and treated even back then. But that was the literal method that he was able to prove that this bacteria causes this, which is crazy. Normally, you know, nowadays you wouldn't think of someone doing that to prove something, scientifically speaking. But back then there wasn't as much technology to help assist or even uh, like uh, nowadays, we use a lot more like computer models and everything like that to help us give a better un understanding. Gallstones. All right. So remember how we talked about the gallbladder, how the gallbladder, its whole job is to store bile, that greenish yellow compound that coats fat. It allows our body to break fat down. Well, turns out the gallbladder is very prone to crystallization. We need cholesterol to make bile. So that's one of the things that is necessary. Remember how we mentioned way back in quarter one that cholesterol is necessary for the cell membrane or the phospholipid bilayer? Cholesterol is also necessary for bile. It's a key component. If you have too much cholesterol and especially too much salt, that's going to cause a crystallization effect. Literally, when they remove the gallbladder, when someone has gallstones, this is something that you could see here, right? Six centimeters in length, a little longer. When they open the gallbladder up, it is filled with these crystal stones. And those stones were the bile that used to be the bile that just solidified and turned into these like rock pebble structures. Now, why that could be problematic, obviously, is that if it starts to form like this, not only are you going to experience a lot of pain, but it can start to damage how well your body secretes bile into the small intestine. And if your body can't secrete bile well into the small intestine, then your body can't digest fat well. And then that starts to damage the rest of the digestive tract. So we really start to run into some major issues here. Uh, so again, normally these gallstones would have to be surgically removed. Another type of stone that you may have obviously heard of, kidney stones. It is a similar situation where you don't have, you're not consuming enough water on a daily basis. Your salt consumption is very high. But the biggest difference with kidney stones is unless your kidney stones are extreme, we're talking about like they've been able to scan them and they look massive in the kidneys. Unfortunately for both men and women, the only safe option is just urinating them. Literally, doctors will tell you this is going to be un uh, uncomfortable, but for the next couple of days, drink a lot of water, so much water that you're urinating regularly throughout the day. And then inevitably you will urinate the stones out. So for kidney stones, it's a little bit more um, of a straightforward process, if you want to call it that, not requiring as much surgical procedures. All right, appendicitis. Here you can actually see the doctor holding uh, the appendix and that, that actually is connected to the large intestine. So part of the large intestine coming on out. Uh, interestingly enough, the procedure to do this, super simple, right? It's called a, laparosco a laparoscopic appendectomy. An appendectomy specifically is the removal of the appendix, but they actually make a small incision, right, in your right, right quadrant. They put in this tube that helps to inflate basically the large intestine, and then they just snap the appendix right off. Simple as that. Like I said, and this happens to quite a number of people as far as the appendix getting inflamed, but it's a vestigial organ, so your body can live without it perfectly fine. Vomiting, also known as emesis. Not a lot of us are uh, comfortable with this stuff, obviously, but vomiting or emesis is caused by irritation of the stomach. Um, that's usually the number one cause, but another big thing could be inner ear disturbance. So going back to when we learned senses, we learned how the, we have three regions of the ear, right? The outer, the middle, and the inner. The inner ear, we have the cochlea, and we have what's called the semicircular canals or the vestibular organ. Those semicircular canals are going to have the fluid inside of them that keeps you balanced. So if you remember growing up and you went to like PE class or like gym or recess or whatever, and you guys ever did like dizzy bat and you spin, 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 that causes those fluids to start to warp around like a, like a washing machine. That can be enough of a factor to get you so dizzy that you'll vomit. Um, it's not for everyone, obviously. Some people, they can adapt really well to that. And that's why that's honestly a big part of like thrill seekers that enjoy like roller coasters and things like that, that their body can be fine in that situation. But for most of us, it's going to be 
vomiting or emesis is going to be due to irritation of the stomach. Um, so what we observe is that the abdominal muscles, so your core muscles, and the diaphragm are going to contract and force everything up. Uh, also known as reverse peristalsis. Because remember, peristalsis is that squeezing motion to move everything downward. Reverse peristalsis, so everything's going right back up. Now, generally speaking, what do we call irritation of the stomach? It could be a number of things. So um, if you are vomiting, usually vomiting is seen as a good thing in the sense that your body recognized something you consumed is harming you or could be more harmful to you so you need to remove it. Sometimes vomiting is a side effect of other medication that you're on or other illnesses that you may have. So you can't really put down anything that you're trying to consume, even if it's not harmful. So obviously in those cases, your body's not helping you out here. But sometimes it could just be literally, you just ate something, it's not even 30 minutes later and your body's trying to get it, get it out. Another example of why vomiting could occur, um, it could be alcohol consumption. So in the instance with alcohol consumption, if you've had so much alcohol throughout the night and you haven't necessarily paced your drinks enough, the problem here is that your liver is catching up. It takes time for your liver to filter the, the, the alcohol you're consuming and not poison you, right? Because if it can't filter enough, it starts to affect your blood and then turn your brain and how you function. And it's the whole side effects of being drunk, right? Well, if your blood alcohol level is such a high level, your body can push yourself to say, hold on a second. We don't want to process this alcohol any longer. We need to start pushing out as much as possible. In situations where people are have drank so much that they need hospitalization, which this happens, you know, for people that get blackout drunk, that is a very scary moment for them because they themselves have no clue what's going on, but their body could be on the verge of death. That is honestly as serious as it needs to be um, for those type of people. If it's so bad like that, you need to be rushed to a hospital and they actually have to pump your stomach. Literally, as that sounds, a tube into your esophagus and they just force everything out of you while this is going on. This is not a pleasant experience. I can't obviously speak by experience to this, but... From my understanding and from people that I know that have had to have this happen, this is nothing that is pleasant in the slightest. Um, but overall, it's just supposed to be something to force anything that could be troubling your digestive system out of your body, which this is better than, in, in most cases, letting it process and, and, and harm you even worse. Okay, so that's where we're going to finish today's video. Um, we don't have too much left. We're on page 26 of 30. So we have a little bit left as far as some conditions associated with the digestive system. And then I want to do just one uh, overview, like just going over some of the major structures. And then that'll be pretty much it for our, our sessions. Thanks for tuning in, guys.